Welcome to this symposium on the stigma of intellectual disability. We have four speakers from around the world. I think it's good just to jump right in. Um, what we're going to do is they're going to speak for about 18, 20 minutes, and then if we have time, give you time to ask any brief questions of them. So our first speaker is Professor Jeremy Turk. He's with Southwark Child and Adolescent Mental Health Neurodevelopmental Service in London. And he's going to speak about labeling and classifications of developmental disabilities. Are they curse or blessing? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction to all of you to coming to this workshop. I hope you can all hear me OK. Uh, it's a great privilege and a pleasure to be presenting here. As I shared with a colleague, I feel slightly outside my comfort zone. Some of you may have seen from the program I'm also presenting later on today in the dual diagnosis workshop, uh, where I feel more at home talking about the medical and neurobiological sides of uh, mental illness as it affects people with developmental disabilities. But I was actually very grateful to the organizers of this workshop for asking me to reflect more on this important area, and important for a number of reasons, but primarily for me because I'm, I'm a medic uh, by training, and it becomes part of one's religion and belief system uh, when you've had that training. To take for granted that labeling is important, that we create the rules, as you heard from Patrick's inspirational talk, that actually it's very dangerous to be in that situation. So it's quite useful for me to be able to take a step back and to consider this uh, important area. Now, there are important cultural differences involved, so we need to keep that in mind. And one that immediately came to mind was Patrick describing me as working in Southwark, which you'd be quite um, entitled to feel would be how you pronounce this term. In uh, England, we're very strange, so that uh, Bissister becomes uh, Bister and Sirencester has its own definition, and this is Southwark, Southwark Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, and as you can see, we, we collaborate with King's College and the University of London. And what I'm going to do in the time available is to talk a bit about uh, the labeling that we've used in the field of developmental difficulties, uh, to think about the advantages and disadvantages of that, and then hopefully to move towards some notion of um, a consensus, a rapprochement, if you like, in terms of how and why and when this might be useful, but also to be mindful of the possible disadvantages as well. Now, is this machine going to work here to uh, change the slides? Um, I'm trying to change it, but nothing's happening. Maybe I need to turn it on. On. I'm sorry, I might have got you here inadvertently. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So it's a useful starting point to always go back in history. And as you're aware, there are many terms that have been used, but not always negative ones. So in France, we had this notion of les enfants du bon Dieu, uh, the children of the good God. So the idea that actually, as a parent, you had been chosen by God because of your inspirational uh, attributes in terms of child rearing to receive the challenge of uh, bringing up a child with disabilities, a child who was different, more challenging from others, uh, but then we had a notion in the play that you might remember if you're a certain vintage like I am, which was based on the plight of individuals from the deaf community. Uh, and actually the title of the play comes from a misinterpretation where the protagonist, a deaf lady, is trying to give an inspirational talk on what it means to be deaf, to be challenged in terms of hearing. And the translator is her boyfriend. It's a college romance of the worst sort because he's a member of the faculty who uh, then engages in a romance with her. And he's trying to translate into verbal language speech as she gives her impassioned talk. And he translates the phrase as children of a lesser god, whereas, of course, she is trying to argue that they are no less than anybody else, that God is the same, whatever your attributes. But moving more towards the present, we've had the profound embarrassment in Europe of certain communities, often from the east of Europe, where individuals with disabilities have been treated very negatively. So in Romania, there was the concept of irrecupables, people who were labeled as not being able to be helped, and therefore going into institutions, and indeed not receiving any help thereafter, thereby compounding their disabilities. Um, and so we had the issue, as you've had 
in your parts of the world in terms of trying to move away from incarceration and institutionalization towards care in the community. And I'll just take a sideways step for a moment because very often I hear people say, care in the community is wrong. Why? It's failed. Why? Because people are not necessarily better off. And I divide the construct into two. The first is a principled ethical one. Where should people exist, irrespective of attributes? Answer clearly, it's what we call a no-brainer. It should be in the community. How do we make that work? By providing sufficient resources. Providing insufficient resources, is that an argument that the movement in principle has failed? No, it just reminds us that any notion, any movement should have the necessary backing and resources to make it work. And unfortunately, that in part, the lack of resources, I believe, has led to what I'd call a fatalistic nihilism. Oh, well, that's just how things are. Nothing can change it. Um, and some of you may be aware, this is another literary allusion, to uh, the final paragraph, in fact, of the great Charles Dickens novel, Little Dorrit, where, little, where the protagonist, the hero, the man, has been confined to a pauper's institution. So that's a residential institution for people with no money. No money, they've become bankrupt financially. And he says to Little Dorrit, who has taken a shining to him, it's nobody's fault, that's just the way we are. And she says, and this is Dick Dickens' brilliant summary of the situation, that's absolutely wrong to say it's nobody's fault and problem, it's everybody's fault and problem, which I think is a beautiful and inspirational statement. However, moving the other way, people have often a sense of naive idealism, and our late Princess Diana in the UK, who I think... Being a, a non-monarchist, I have to say this, she, is, she was my favorite member of royalty, but nonetheless said something a little bit naive. I know where she was coming from. She said, really, for people, whatever their issue, disabilities, mental illness, etc., all you need is love, and uh, all you need is to give them a hug. And we knew where she was coming from, but again, that was not helping the situation. And so we're still stuck with this challenge between over-medicalization on the one hand, this is a medical issue even to be cured, uh, and on the other hand, I think there is a risk of over-socialization. Many people, as I was discussing with Patrick before I started to talk, with the attributes that we call disabilities, will say it's not all great, there are issues we would like to change, and it's not clever, uh, and it's not right that you as a professional say, well, that's fine, you are how you are and obviously it depends on what attribute we're talking about. But getting back on track, I think it's useful to consider what do we mean when we talk about developmental disabilities. And there's no consensus, but this, if you like, is Jeremy's spin, Jeremy's take on it. So working as a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the field of developmental disabilities and associated mental health issues, I would argue these are usually, not always, but usually very early onset conditions, uh, which are long term. And rather like the London bus system, they tend to go along together as multiples. And the important thing is they interfere with what's normally the fluent acquisition of more average skills. What doesn't surprise me as a developmentalist is that some individuals develop challenges issues. When you think how complex human development is, what does surprise me is despite all the adversities that we experience, biological, psychological and social, nonetheless we seem to do okay much of the time. Uh, why are these skills important? Well, for two reasons, I think. The first is an entirely uh, abstract one that we call maximization of potential. I often preach the fact, I do what I do to help maximize individuals' potential. But none of the, us in this room, I'd put to you, actually know what our potential is, although we aspire towards it. Curious. However, quality of life is eminently measurable and I keep on arguing to my employees that these are the outcome measures we should be using to show hopefully that what I do is worthwhile. It's not very clever to just have a symptom checklist. For example, one item on the symptom checklist I'm forced to use being, does this child have difficulties learning? Answer when they come to my clinic, yes. When they leave my clinic, yes. Therefore, Jerome is not doing any good and this individual is not going anywhere. But I'd like to think, please don't, do not burst my bubble, that actually I may be doing something in however small a way to help enhance the quality of life of that individual and those around them. But of course, they're at risk of having associated what we call secondary disabilities, the adverse, often physical as well as psychological, what we call functional 
consequences. So I thought it'd be useful just to reflect for a minute or two on what we mean by the different terminologies we use and intellectual disability, a term which I think is as good if not better than most others, uh, traditionally has related to 2 to 3 percent of the population. This is a purely statistical phenomenon. There's nothing magical or mystical or medical about it indeed. It just for the statisticians amongst you mean uh, implies that where IQ has a normal distribution, the mean stroke, median stroke mode is 100, the standard deviation is 15, there we are, I've lost you all already. So if you're more than two standard deviations below the mean, I fall in the bottom two to three percent of this population label-wise, uh, you have an intellectual disability, provided you also have significant impairments in what we call adaptive behaviors, and those are listed there. And there is some relevance here in that these are often the challenges that individuals with these attributes of intellectual disability face. Uh, but I think what's really interesting is to look at the DSM-5 progression. Many of my colleagues are shocked and disgusted by this. I think it's fascinating. I think it's actually very important because the most uh, striking component of this change, this adaptation, which is conspicuous by its absence, is that we no longer need low IQ as a diagnosis in principle. It is absent from the diagnostic criteria, although you are encouraged to consider it in terms of the associated commentary. We're talking about the issues relating to these th three vital domains of conceptual, social, and practical. So conceptual being uh, what we call in Britain the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, social being more the aspects that perhaps those said to be on the autism spectrum may experience, and practical practical being the adaptive behaviors, the functional impairments as described on the previous slide. I think this is important for a number of other reasons. Firstly, that we're moving away from more derogatory and unhelpful labels, and I'll mention just a few of the disadvantages of these in a few minutes. Uh, that we're aware there are euphemisms, intellectual developmental disorder, that it's a spectrum. Uh, but also that it moves the way away from what we call a hierarchical system. Now, in mental health, we have a so-called multi-axial classification, multiple axes defining the individual in various ways. And axis one, which has been often taken to mean the most important, is the psychiatric illness, which is confusing because it still includes autism spectrum disorders and ADHD as psychiatric illnesses, which of course they're not. They're developmental disabilities, but that's what my esteemed colleagues have decided to do classification-wise. Um, but this acknowledges that it should be much more of a level playing field, that these are comorbidities, or I think far better term, co-occurrences, which combined together may say things about the individual's vulnerabilities. And this is just my glib way of emphasizing the point, what is an IQ? IQ? I put up this slide for the students I tutor, and the answer is that which is measured by an IQ test. And if you ask the opposite, well, okay, what does an IQ test measure? The answer is, well, it measures IQ. So this isn't taking you much further. And again, it's an algebraic quirk. Uh, and uh, again, I won't go into the complexities of the algebra, but it's simply to do with how old you are, the chronological age, and how old we will say you are, in rather simplistic, naive terms, your mental age, and then divide one by the other and for good measure multiply by 100. So very much arbitrary, very much committee driven, and hence very limited in its usefulness. And as some of you will know, there are different gradations of intellectual disability, but just to give you a flavor of the confusion there may be, so these, this top one intellectual disability is our health classification. The bottom one is the classification used by educationalists in the United Kingdom. And you can see the level of confusion there, what I call mild, my educational colleagues call moderate. When they talk about learning difficulties, I think they're talking about something mild or not so general and global, for example, dyslexia or dyspraxia, uh, and so confusion reigns. And so I feel obliged now to become quite long-winded, verbose in my report, saying this individual has mild intellectual disability or an educational terminology, moderate learning difficulties, and therefore. 
Going back again historically, we need to recognize that there was a time, and it's fascinating to read some of those historical textbooks, where these terms had real meaning and a real relevance and were synonymous with our current notions of mild or moderate or severe to profound intellectual disability. But I was always very depressed by the presence of this term in DSM up to and including DSM-4 and indeed in the International Classification of Diseases which we use in the UK. Uh, people don't like being called mental because the majority of people with intellectual disability are not, although they have a greater vulnerability to mental illness than the rest of us. And retard obviously has extremely derogatory connotations, but actually definition-wise in the dictionary, it means a slowing down of development to which often parents painfully in my clinic will say, okay, she slowed down, but when's she gonna catch up? And that has all sorts of implications in terms of understanding and vision and actually acknowledgement of the individual situation. Again, subnormality is unuseful in terms of its statistical implication that you belong to the bottom 50% of the population. Again, I love to tell my students, I am subnormal. I am only five foot six, which is rather on the short side uh, for a not so Western European white male uh, thankfully, it doesn't interfere with other attributes I have, and again, please don't suggest I'm wrong in this, like my academic and clinical achievements, uh, my musicality and playing the piano, but hey, in other ways, uh, I'm pretty impaired and disabled. I've never learned to bowl at cricket, which for a British person is a real disadvantage, uh, and I can't dive into a swimming pool, and you know, it really upsets me when people say, it's very easy, Jeremy, you just do that. I can't, I do a horrendous belly flop, and it's jolly painful. Uh, that term has obvious problems in itself. And this is another one my pedi pediatric colleagues like, and I also always feel that they are trying to avoid the pain of sharing the nature of the issue. Developmental delay, it's a wonderful term, global developmental delay, and then the parents come to me later on and say, again, well, when's he or she going to catch up? Why was I given the impression early on by the pediatrician that it may be slow, but things will come out just the same as for the majority of the population. And so I think we went a step further towards reasonableness, at least in the United Kingdom, in developing these terms, which are still the ones used by our Department of Health and government. But again, you see, you in North America use a different term. Uh, you, think, you say that applies to specific, what we call specific learning difficulties. And so I think intellectual disability is a good compromise in those ways. But you know, even so, depending on who you see and depending on what the nature of your problems are, so you'll get different labels. So if you go to an educational psychologist or perhaps a pediatrician, you may get that label. If you go to a child psychiatrist, you may get that one. And indeed, it's random choice whether you get that one. And of course, the irritating thing is that my clients haven't read the textbooks, not even mine, so they don't know how to behave. And they have a mixture of all these aspects, as do us all but perhaps the nearer you are to the center of that Venn diagram, the more challenging your multiple and complex needs will be, and perhaps the more likely you are to see an individual like me. But just to reiterate, we're not talking about mental illnesses, we're talking about developmental disabilities, but ones that can predispose to mental illness for a variety of biological, psychological, and social reasons. I shall skim over these, but this was just to make the point that these, disorder, these issues uh, are considered disorders, I was having a very interesting discussion over the break with a mother who has uh, now an adult offspring with ADHD and she was saying this common theme that actually people have seen my son as so disabled, he's never been given any, any opportunities. And the sad but fascinating thing for me was she said once he moved away from his zone of growing up to another environment, he was accepted and did very well in various areas of ability, but once he returned to his group and culture and growing up environment, the stigma kind of returned. So we can see that there have been changes over time, that these issues are very common if you look at the statistics. Um, and they are important actually to people like me because uh, if you have uh, a developmental disability, you are more prone to mental illness and that does interact with deprivation disadvantage. And the important issue which I point out to in people is that if we say those with what we'd call in the health trade, uh, severe to profound intellectual disability, they have a 50-50 chance of having an associated mental health issue or otherwise behavioral challenge. And then you can multiply that by two if you've been a victim of profound 
uh, social deprivation and disadvantage. Hang on, the crowd shouts. That means you've got a 100% chance of having a mental health issue. And the answer is tragically yes. And uh, as a matter of a social comment, uh, it is tragic that here we have the group who are most disadvantaged in society, mental health-wise, and probably get the least investment in resources per capita. This just reminds us that actually you don't need intellectual disability to have issues. This is very exquisite data from my colleague Professor Rob Goodman at the Institute of Psychiatry in London showing that if you have any issue affecting neurodevelopment like cerebral palsy, quite consistent with average intellectual functioning or, or, or even epilepsy, you are more prone to mental health and developmental disability issues. As I mentioned, we try to cope with this fact by having a multi-axial approach. I'm sorry this is a very speedy resume, but you can see how this could work in practice. The black wording being the actual definitions of the certain axes and the red being examples. So here we have an individual where causal issues are fragile X syndrome, the genetic condition you heard around about this morning. The consequences may be ADHD, plus some specific issues to do with working memory and fine motor impairment. The IQ is in the mild intellectual disability range. There are complicating physical aspects, uh, but most importantly, the degree of functional impairment will be extreme. And so I think there are some importances of diagnosis, the right of the individual to know, relief of uncertainty of the individual or their family, facilitating any associated grief for resolution, and promoting the ability to focus on the future. In some conditions, genetic counseling is very important. You can learn more about the associated strengths and needs, let's be, let's be honest, and also there's a potential for early instigation of ameliorative programs, as well as most importantly, linking with appropriate support networks. So I've tried to list some of the advantages of labeling, labeling here. Let's go back. I think it can be a convenient and helpful shorthand. I think it emphasizes similarities, both with the general population as well with your colleagues who have these uh, issues. I think it helps in facilitating the link between diagnosis at the start and prevalence and symptomatology. It can facilitate research and it can enable individuals to relate to others with similar challenges. Last slide, Patrick, uh, there are disadvantages, which I'm conscious they're aware of, albeit as a mental health specialist working with children and young people. It does oversimplify, it stereotypes, it does tend to risk denying the uniqueness of each individual. It tends to impose what we call a one-size-fits-all approach, as well as running the risk of pathologizing human development and all its diversity. And it does risk placing certain individuals at the margins of society. So my conclusion is inevitably that there is a balance to be drawn, that I passionately believe there is a vital utility, usefulness, in certain forms of labeling but we need to be continually mindful, conscious of the possible risks as well. So thank you very much for your kind attention to my talk. Clock, we're gonna save time at the end for questions afterwards. So let's move on to the next presentation. We have Professor Lisa Wilson, who's from the School of Psychological Sciences and Health at the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, Scotland. And she's gonna talk about the influence of societal stereotypes and attitudes and behaviors of parents and children towards children with intellectual disabilities. Lisa. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Um, so uh, what I'm thinking about here is how might society's negative stereotypes of disability influence the two key adults in a child's life, parents and teachers, as they go about the business of parenting and teaching? Um, and in particular, how might these negative stereotypes, um, societal stereotypes, influence 
their beliefs. So this is about parent beliefs, and I'm going to talk about parent beliefs first and then teacher beliefs. Um, I should say I'm, um, I'm an academic now. Um, previously, I worked as a home visitor with parents, and I also worked as a, um, a psychologist, a school psychologist, with um, an organization for people with disabilities. So I've worked very, very closely with parents and their children, the same parents, over a period of, of years. Um, so, in thinking about parent beliefs, um, I wanted to flag that up because it's partly influenced by my experience with parents as well as um, reading, reading and uh, thinking. In thinking about this, um, I proposed a model um, and how I want you to look at this, um, what, what we have here, the three, the four columns, left hand column is societal views of disability. The middle column is if parents absorb that view, what would they be, you know, what would they be thinking? And the next column is if that's what they're thinking, how would they be behaving towards their child? And the final column is so what would the child, what would, what might the child's behavior be? Now I'm just going to talk about the top line of that. So, you know, leave the other bits just now. So, for example, um, if um, the parent of, uh, if, if we take this, the kind of um, medical model of disability rather than the social model, that disability is a medical problem, medically construction of, a medical construction of disability, then parents of a disabled child will, their belief will be, we're going to have to cope with developmental problems, with health problems, behavioral problems, these are part of the child's condition, that's what we can expect. Now, if they take that view on, what, can, what are their parenting behaviours likely to be? Um, what I'm proposing in this model is they're likely to tolerate problematic behaviour and it's child behaviour problems that I'm talking about for this session. Um, I, I'm aware that people don't have um, an abstract for, for some reason, so I'm assuming you know what I'm going to talk about, but I realise it's not in the, in the, in the uh, brochure. Um, if parents took on that kind of belief, then their behaviour would be that they would tolerate child behaviour problems. They believe it to be part of their child's disability, and the, you know, so, therefore, they're not going to try and uh, do anything to change these behaviour problems they would tolerate them. If parents tolerate problems, and I'm now moving to the far right, so it's if, if, if. If parents tolerate behavior problems as part of the child's disability, then you're likely to have, the, the child is likely to have perpetuate behavior problems, daytime, nighttime problems. Why not? Because parents are not acting to, to, to change that. Okay, so that's kind of a um, conceptual idea. What is the evidence for this model? Starting from the, the right-hand side, the behaviour problem part of it, um, well, there is evidence of, of behaviour problems in children with intellectual disabilities. It's, it's a, a reasonably well-established finding that there's a higher rate of behaviour problems in that group compared to typically developing children. Um, let's move to the middle bit, though, because that's kind of the, 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 the interesting part, um, the beliefs and the behaviours of parents. Um, so what is the evidence for a parent's beliefs um, ab about the causes of behaviour? Yes, there are studies um, with different kind of um, populations, developmental disability popula uh, populations, that show that when parents view sample behavior, um, problem behaviours as caused by internal and stable fixed factors such as disability, um, they're less likely to be effective in managing the behaviour which is the argument that's being presented there. So, um, for example, uh, Johnson et al., um, that's a study with mothers of children with ADHD, um, Whittington et al. with um, autism spectrum disorder. So are, these are all studies showing links between parents' beliefs about um, um, internal stable causes of disability and behavior problems in the child, linking the two. Um, the last two there, the Robinson and the Keenan um, studies, uh, are both with populations of children with intellectual disabilities and sleep disorders. And again, the, the finding there is parents viewing the problems as fixed, therefore not, um, not seeing much point in attempting an intervention because 
they don't expect. It's, it's not worth their energy and effort because they don't expect it's going to help the problems within the child, therefore there's not much to be done. So what's the way forward? Well, if parents can attribute the cause of problem behaviour to less stable, less internally um, focused causes than the intellectual disability itself, this can provide handles for change um, and these open possibilities to improve problem behaviours. It gives you something to work on. Um, the, the cause of the misbehaviour may be that the child needs to learn to comply with instructions um, or needs to learn to share their toys. Um, whether or not a child has an intellectual disability, you know, these are some of the tasks of parenting and some of the developmental tasks of childhood. Or misbehaviour um, can be attributed, could be attributed to parents not managing the situation um, very, as well as they might. So the child was overtired, that's why they misbehaved. Or they were bored, um, or they didn't understand what, what was happening or what, what they were being asked. Um, Here's an example from a study by one of my research group, Mirti Jacobs, and it's just you know, what, the, what the parent is saying, and it's about understanding. But what I learned was that if I say get off the chair and I wait, what others would say, too long, she will get off the chair. And I said to the teachers, whatever you ask her to do, wait more than seems polite, and you'll often find she will respond. And they did use that, because I think it takes a long time. People with Down syndrome, they can't process quickly. So there you have a parent who's understanding that um, there is a problem with the child's behaviour following instructions, but instead of simply saying she can't follow instructions, she won't do as she's told, um, understanding a way of the parent managing, controlling that situation, actually sharing it with others. Um, so, as well as um, the idea of the locus of um, the, the cause being internal to the child, and as well as the idea of the cause of the, the behaviour problem being stable, we can add the cause being uncontrollable. These are three unhelpful beliefs, I would suggest, for parenting a child, whether the child has um, a, a, an intellectual disability or not. And here's an example of a parent um, acknowledging that. Right at this moment, things are definitely getting worse. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. It's not like if you have a typically developing child, you'll say, oh, he will grow out of it. So it's just that idea of you know, not, not being able to do anything about it. Now, in one of, one of our studies, we did find um, that kind of usual finding that I pointed to up, up at the beginning about behaviour problems being, um, the, there being greater uh, behaviour problems in an, a developmental disability group uh, than compared to typically developing. But what we found was that if we put controllability into the mix, if we divided parents into high controllability and low controllability groups, then um, we didn't get that difference in behaviour problems. So the left-hand side, the, the top line is the developmental disability group, the bottom line is the typically developing group. On the left-hand side, you get that difference. This is for rule-breaking behaviour from the child uh, behaviour checklist, but we also got similar um, graphs for other behaviours. So you get that kind of difference where the typically developing children have fewer behaviour problems. But when we put controllability in, we only get that for where there is low controllability on, on maternal controllability. Her, that's the mother's perception of her controllability, not an external measure. And that, um, that, that's gone um, in the high controllability condition. So I think what we're seeing here is that on the left-hand side, some parents adopt negative societal beliefs and expectations about their lack of control over the child's behaviour. Um, that would be the, the high DD group, if you like. And, um, but on the right-hand side, we see parents uh, that have changed their views of um, their controllability of the child's condition and uh, have reframed, if you like, reframed their ideas. And here's a couple of quotes um, reframing. I think before I would have wrapped her up in cotton wool, overprotected. I treat her differently now than I would have. And here's another one. And I remember this interview very well. It was a very long interview um, and really very powerful. If she wanted anything, everything was put on hold, including her brother. 
I realized we would have to change our behavior and I told my husband. So that's a kind of child, um, everything the child wanted had to be done. This was the family sort of narrative because of the disability. She mustn't cry, she mustn't be upset, her needs must be met immediately, um, no matter what anybody else is doing. And the mother realized this was not a way to, to proceed. Um, and controllability is actually a tricky area because as well as parent controllability, we can talk about child controllability. Um, what, to, what, to what extent did the, does the child have control of their behavior? And um, there, uh, the, there's evidence that where parents believe their child has high controllability of the behavior, that can be associated with um, negative um, emotion from the parent and often punishment and ineffective parenting strategies. But I think there's a bit of a paradox here because if you want your child to learn something, you've got to believe they have some degree of control of their behavior. Um, so th I think that's the kind, of, the kind of helpful belief that, that, that the parent needs to, to have here. There is a kind of issue about what people understand by child control. Often um, concepts like blame and responsibility, intention are wrapped up in that. And we're actually looking at that, trying to separate these out. I'm going to move on to talking about teachers now. Um, in terms of teachers absorbing negative stereotypes of disability, inclusion's been around for a long time, um, and uh, uh, over 30 years. And, uh, it's, but its implementation, the policies have been there, but its implementation depends on teachers. And we've been very interested in teachers' views of, of inclusive education. I think it's a good marker of how teachers feel the influence of negative societal stereotypes. So I'm just going to tell you about a couple of studies that we've carried out. Um, in this one, we compared three groups of teachers. Um, and what we were looking at was um, what were their beliefs about, again, controllability and change in terms of the, of the learner, learner's difficulties. Um, and what we found, what, what, I should say we, we identified a difficulty, um, the same difficulty, but in, in some of the vignettes, the learner was flagged up as having, we implied it, the, the, the child had a long-term learning difficulty, while in others, with the same difficulty in learning, um, we implied rather that it was a kind of transitory difficulty, that I mean, every, everybody's got difficulties learning, reading and maths and so on at some point. So the difficulty was the same, but we implied um, to, to different groups of, of learners. And, what we found here was that there were two groups of mainstream teachers actually. There were mainstream general class teachers and mainstream learning support teachers. So that's the red line at the top and the, the blue line at the bottom. And the green line is special school teachers. So th these were our three groups. And what you can see is an interaction effect there. That's for controllability. Um, belief in the teachers being, um, b belief, sorry, this is belief in child controllability and the child being able to uh, learn and, and develop beyond the problem that they have. Um, and what you can see there is that the two groups of mainstream school teachers saw the two groups of learners as being very different in terms of whether they actually thought the child could do something about the, whatever they were sticking on in reading and maths. Um, the special school teachers really just saw the two groups as pretty much the same. Um, more focused on what the problem was, what they can do about it, but it didn't much matter whether you said the child had a, you know, implied the child had a longer term need or not. Um, so it, that um, seems to me that the mainstream teachers are strongly influenced by negative societal stereotypes, but not so the special school teachers. So what we're then thinking about is, okay, so what changed the special school teachers? Is it their training? Is it their experience uh, with uh, populations of children with difficulties? Um, so we carried out another study to try and um, identify this. Um, and I'm afraid, I, I suppose I should say the bottom line is we haven't really nailed what it is one might do about training in order to um, change people's attitudes. We found that teachers who had more than 15 years experience of teaching 
viewed, were more likely to view difficulties as internal to the child. So that to me, um, I mean you maybe think of a, a more positive interpretation, but that to me suggests entrenched negative societal views. Um, teachers who had experience of working with children with um, special educational needs, as, as um, we labeled it then, um, were more likely to view the locus of the problem as external to the child. So uh, for a teacher that would be the curriculum wasn't right for the child or the teaching methods weren't appropriate, we didn't deliver it pro um, you know, in the right way. So that, if I can um, you know, think back to what we were saying about the parents, that, um, that, that's a kind of uh, reframing of negative societal views in a way that's more optimistic and that allows you to change because you can change the curriculum, you can deliver in a, in a, in a better way. Um, in, so still on the theme of um, training and professional development, um, in another study we had uh, 199 mainstream teachers and we actually couldn't find evidence that training, that we, we just couldn't find any link with training or professional development um, changing teachers' views in a positive way. And in fact, a um, colleague of mine in, um, in Australia, um, Stuart Woodcock, has just, um, he's just writing up a, a study with Canadian teachers, and he actually found that the teachers' views were even more <laughs> negative about inclusion after professional development. So, so there's something that we're not doing quite right there. Um, I've got a PhD student who's working with me at the moment and she, she found that um, agreeableness is associated with more positive attitudes towards um, learner, inclusion of learners, but um, you know, agreeableness is a personality a characteristic. Where, where teachers hold negative stereotypes, um, I think training and professional development might not be doing enough then to challenge these. I think maybe um, uh, training, professional development um, and uh, pre-service training might be focused on either identifying the difference, um, you know, very kind of medicalizing, this is the nature of the problem that a child with Asperger's might have or um, ADHD, um, but not necessarily helping the teachers skill themselves up um, to work with that group so they don't feel they're, they're likely to be effective um, and their beliefs, the negative societal beliefs that they start off with remain entrenched. Um, now what I've done here is, I've, I, what I've tried to do, um, you'll be the judge of whether I did it or not, uh, is I've tried to pre pre present evidence that in order to parent a child with a developmental disability effectively, in order to teach a child with a developmental disability effectively, it's necessary to overcome negative societal stereotypes about learning and behavior problems in children uh, with disabilities. And by that, I mean it's actually necessary to reframe and to think differently, to think positively about the nature of the difficulties. So parent intervention programs and teacher training and professional development programs, I think, need to focus on challenging um, beliefs, um, really to, 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 to provide opportunities for parents and teachers to discuss their beliefs and understandings about the child's difficulties. and. Uh, and, and, and so that these are no longer a barrier to the kinds of interventions that, that they may be carrying out. And uh, I'm just looking to see what you're going to hold up there. Two minutes, fine, excellent. Um, I'm, do, I'm just going to finish with a, with a reframing story. Um, just last week, um, I was um, discussing with a parent who's very, very worried about a very young child um, who has some kind of as yet undiagnosed developmental disability but it's kind of clear to the parent that something is not right and there are associated behavior problems and there may or may not be learning problems and there's certainly communication uh, problems at the moment and the parent it seemed to us had a very good understanding of these and was doing everything that one might um, um, when I say doing everything she'd arrange the right kind of interventions for the child and um, we had a long discussion about um, the nature of the child's difficulties and you know, what, what she was looking for, kind of pushing, maybe should there be some kind of diagnosis, what would it be, what difference would that make to her, what difference would that make to how to proceed 
with um, intervention. And, you know, we, we discussed that at some length. And in the end, the parent wa un understood that actually she had, a good, she had good insight into the child's problems. She was actually, she'd arranged the right kind of intervention in terms of schooling and um, uh, other therapies. And she felt very, very effective as a parent as a result of the, of the discussion. And uh, in the end, she called to say she and her husband were cracking up a bottle of champagne. Now, I can tell you nothing had changed Nothing had changed. The child was no different from how the child had been at the start, but what had changed was the parent had completely reframed how she thought about the child's difficulties. Um, so I thank you very much. I'm going to finish up with a picture of Glasgow, where I'm from, and a picture of the Pointy Building is a new building that was opened by Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh on Friday, and I had lunch with the Queen at the opening. Just thought I'd say that. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. Well, we're switching over. Next will be Dr. Katrina Shore. Did I put your name? Um, who's going to talk to us about do they do what they say, out questioning the link between self-reported attitudes towards people, intellectual disabilities, and actual behavior. Katrina? Thank you. I'm, I'm afraid I can't trump our queen coming to open any buildings. I'm, I'm afraid. I've never, I've never met her. I've seen her mother driving past in a car, waving, waving at us as she quite frequently does in central London, where I, where I live and work. Okay, I wanted to, um, some of the things uh, Lisa was talking about and certainly what Pat was talking about this morning, in a lot of the research we do re rely on measures. And I wanted to do a bit of taking us back to basics and hopefully convincing you that actually spending some time thinking about measures is a pretty worthwhile endeavor. Now we've known for a very long time, I've put a quote up there back from the 16th century, that what people say is one thing and what they do is another. Now we've known this forever, but unfortunately it seems in research, we very often ignore that, the fact that we know that. Uh, sorry, I'm having the, how did you manage to go down? Okay, sorry, it does seem to need the remote. <laughs> okay, okay, one, one of the problems in a lot of the research trying to figure out what is it that, that people say and to what extent does it reflect on what they do is that we rely on, on attitude measures. And the more and more I've been working with attitude measures in our research, the more and more dubious and, and questionable have, have I found the majority of the attitude measures that are around in the intellectual disability field. Now, why is this an important question at all? In, in our program at UCL, we've moved into trying to do quite a lot of stigma busting, trying to develop interventions to, to improve attitudes to people with intellectual disabilities. And obviously one of the things we want to do is to find out, does this make a difference? Is it having any positive effect? Or as Pat was talking earlier, are we having lots of unintended consequences and so on? In order to be able to do that, we need good measures to track changes over time. If we compare different sections of the population and populations in different countries around the world, we need to be able to identify where we should be targeting our interventions by taking accurate measurements. And I've talked about evaluating the, the impact already. Now, a lot of the research in the field, certainly these days, draws on a three-component model of attitudes. So we're all pretty much agreeing that attitudes or the broader concept of stigma consists of a cognitive co component, which is how, how people think about something or how people think about people with a certain label or diagnosis. Um, the affective component, how, how we feel about somebody or a thing, and the behavioral component, how we might act towards somebody. Now, the real problem in a lot of the research literature, certainly in the area of intellectual disability, is that we usually focus on number one and possibly number one and two, and number three we hardly ever look at because it's a bit messy and a bit tricky and we'll do that next time if we get around to it. So what we have is a constant shortcoming that we've got all these cognitive and effective aspects of attitudes which are measured, but we don't actually know very often what that means for actual behavior. Now, it's a real challenge because a few, 
I mean, funding is always an issue. So, so in the UK, most of our studies have used convenient samples, and a lot of the time we end up with fairly highly educated, not very representative typical populations. Our colleagues in Canada, Helen Ouellet, Kunz, and so on, have managed to do a number of representative general population studies, and they come up with very similar findings as people mostly say some pretty nice things about people with intellectual disabilities. They're perfectly happy to have them around, to interact with them, and so on. Now, that doesn't coincide with what people with intellectual disabilities tell us about their lived experience. They very often, as children, they are very often bullied, they are excluded from social activity as adults, they're called names, they're abused in the streets. So it just doesn't tally with sort of nice, nice results from, from attitude research. And some other reasons, why, why is it? So giving people measures, which is what most of the, the attitude ID literature does, giving people measures, there's sort of two, two key problems. First of all, most people like people to think that they're fairly nice. So they'll say the right sort of thing or what they think um, the researcher might want to hear. And also their demand characteristics. If I start giving people a measure, asking them about their attitudes towards people with intellectual disabilities, most of the time, they'll be picking up what I'm after, what I'm trying to measure, and that I want them probably to say some fairly nice things. So they respond to either very evident or very subtle cues. This, this little cartoon I rather liked, they're very, very obvious cues. Quite often we do something quite similar. The chicken turns up at the door and says, please answer true or false. If I were a chicken, I would gladly suffer and die to become a nugget. We ask people a lot of very similar questions in research on attitudes towards people with disabilities, but then take their responses at face value. And usually what we do, we acknowledge at the end that it's fairly problematic. So most research articles you read, I'm very, very guilty of this myself, we say, um, obviously, some of the limitations, we don't know what this means for attitudes, or if we try and be quite, quite posh and well-spoken, we talk about limited ecological validity and so on. And I've done it many, many times my, myself. So what, what we are starting to do at the moment is to try and find some ways to get around this. And I thought today I'll tell you about two, two different things we're, we're doing at UCL at the moment. Before I do that, though, Shirley Werner, who's going to be talking after me, has recently has just published a paper on one way of getting around this. If we ask people direct questions, what would you do versus we ask them about a third person? What do you think this person would do in the situation? Interestingly, we immediately find there isn't a very close match. People say, I would be doing very nice, sorry, I would be doing very nice things myself, but, oh, that other person, they would be prejudiced and hold negative attitudes. Yeah? So that suggests that perhaps combining direct measures with more indirect questions is one way we should be thinking about going forward. Some of the things we've been doing uh, in our research program at UCL, and I'll, I'll take you quickly through those, is to look at implicit attitudes, the relationship between those and explicit attitudes. Explicit attitudes are what we usually measure in research. So we give people a questionnaire, we give them a survey, or whatever and they directly report their attitudes. Implicit att attitudes are intended to, or certainly the, the official account is that they're more unconscious attributions, unconscious beliefs people hold. And I'll show you in a moment how we measure them and why they might be tapping into something a bit be below the surface. Um, we're also just at the moment trying to develop some direct tests of real life behavior and then trying to look at what is the relationship between what we find in those and measures of explicit and implicit attitudes. So one of the earlier studies we did was trying to look at the relationship between explicit and implicit attitudes and Michelle Wilson, a former graduate student of ours at UCL, ran a study with 326 participants and gave them a series of um, very commonly used um, explicit attitude measures and also developed um, a single an implicit association test specifically for people with intellectual disabilities and I'll give you a bit of an idea if you're not familiar with the implicit association test or IAT. The IAT is the most widely used measure of implicit associations. There are a few other ones but it's fairly typical of other ones. So the IAT has been used quite widely in the States in particular to for example 
um, assess attitudes towards people of different ethnic or racial backgrounds. So it either uses images or it uses words appearing on a screen. It's usually a computer-based based test. So in this example, there are pictures either of a white or black person, and the person has to use two keys on the keyboard to sort those pictures into, into different categories. Yeah? So in this example, um, they've got bad on one side, good on the other, and they're then asked to sort the different images to these different words. So a, pi a, pi a picture of a white or black person might appear, and they need to try and sort them as fast as they can into a good or bad category. And they are told in one scenario, sort all the pictures of the white person into the good category by using the keyboard keys. And a short while later, they're instructed to turn it around. So sort all the pictures of the white person into the bad category. Yeah? So, so it's a test simply asking people to sort images or, or words. It's pretty fun. There's a whole number of IATs you can try out on the Project Implicit website, which is held at, at Harvard. And it's fun trying them out. How the person's um, score is developed, how we decide what sort of implicit attitudes they hold, we measure their response times. So we're not interested in their responses, but we're interested how fast they respond and how many errors they make. And I'll give you um, an example of our IAT, and I think hopefully it, it'll, it'll become clearer. When we developed a test specific to intellectual disabilities, we quickly came across it's impossible to use images because um, disability IATs have usually used images of wheelchairs, people with visual impairments using white sticks and so on. There are no such images to signify the category of intellectual disability. So just about all campaigns, fundraising campaigns and so on, um, about people with intellectual disabilities will show children or adults with Down syndrome because it's the one visible feature of intellectual disability, but it's a very, very small proportion of people with intellectual disability, so it simply isn't appropriate. So we decided that we needed to use words as stimuli. And we use the general words from, from Project Implicit in terms of signifying a pleasant category. So the pleasant words we used and asked people to sort into different categories are happiness, laughter, joyful, rainbow, and sunshine. And they're also given five unpleasant words, which they similarly have to sort as fast as possible into either pleasant or unpleasant categories. So that's the first thing they do, and they've got quite a lot of trials to get used to where they should be putting words as they appear one, on, one, one by one on the screen. Once they've got the hang of that, we then add the category we're actually interested in. And we arrived at those words through quite a lot of piloting and identifying what words people most associate with the category of intellectual disability. And I think the first thing to notice, that, so these are the five words which consistently we found people most strongly associate with intellectual disability. And lo and behold, most of them, I think, are horrendously negative. So they are about impairment, they're about dependency, and so on. If we use positive words, so a lot of people like to talk about exceptional people, exceptional children, nobody out there is going to pick up that we talk about people with intellectual disabilities. It may be politically correct, but it simply wouldn't signify that, that category. So to give you an idea, so what the person, so on the screen, this one word, special needs, would pop up in the middle of the screen, and they're instructed to either sort all the words which are related to the category of intellectual disability, either into the pleasant category, in which case they press the left button on the keyboard, or into the unpleasant category, and they press the, the right button. Yeah? And then this is switched over. In the next round, they'd be instructed to sort all the words to do with ID into the pleasant category. Okay? And we've called it the congruent and the incongruent con um, condition because knowing that generally intellectual disability is viewed very negatively in society, we would predict that people would be faster sorting all sorts of words to do with intellectual disability, special needs, dependent, impaired, and so on, into, into the unpleasant category rather than into the pleasant category. Okay? Now, sorry, I'm mindful of the, the time. 
maybe if I, if I go there. So in this, in this study, what we found, so we used some fairly standard measures of attitudes, the class ID, the community living attitude scale, which is very, very widely used in attitudes research around the world when people look at attitudes to people with intellectual disabilities. And we found very similar to other studies, really, really positive attitudes. So our sample were massively in favor of empowering people with intellectual disabilities. They didn't think they should be excluded from society, but they were very, very, very low on any desire for exclusion and viewed people with ID as very similar to themselves. Similarly, we used two different scales to measure social distance as a measure of, of stigma, and again, the scores overall were, were very low. So we were talking about explicitly a very positive group of people here. But then their, their IAT scores, if I go back for a moment, they were on the whole, typically, they were, they were slightly negative in terms of their implicit attitudes. And very interestingly, it was such a very, very positive group of people, 7.5% showed very strongly negative implicit attitudes, <clears throat> and another 27% showed moderately negative attitudes. So I've summarized our findings there. So our, our general explicit attitudes were pretty similar to what has been found in other studies. They were very positive. People either have positive attitudes, which doesn't tally with what we hear from people with intellectual disabilities, or they've learned that actually it's not okay any longer to express negative attitudes towards, towards people with intellectual disabilities. Okay, I won't, I won't bother with those. So what does it tell us? Either implicit attitudes are less positive than explicit attitudes, or perhaps implicit attitudes provide a more realistic reflection of a general antipathy within society towards people with intellectual disabilities, or perhaps what I think is probably more likely, they reflect what, what colleagues have called aversive disabilism. So a lot of people might say, great, which is something we found in other qualitative research, if we hold individual interviews or focus groups, people will say very, very positive things. Of course people should be empowered and they should be supported to have equal rights in society and so on. If we get into somewhat more tricky areas though, so in, in past research we've asked people about working in shared workplaces and using joint leisure facilities and using shared swimming pools, people's attitudes very fast retreat to a less positive position because actually they're not able, it's, it's of the nimbyism not in my own backyard and actually that's a bit too close, too close for comfort. Or the other suggestion is, I'm still unconvinced that implicit attitudes are all they are, they are held out to be. Perhaps actually what it really means is people are very, very aware of all the negative stereotypes around intellectual disability out there and simply reflect that, and it's reflected in the very negative terminology. Okay, I'm not going to bother with that one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to the next one. So, so we've, we've looked at implicit attitudes as one measure, surely studied indirect attitudes and so on, but there's still, we're still not quite getting into, so what does it actually really tell us for how people might behave in, in the real world? How can we really, really try and figure out what's the relationship between what people tell us and what they actually do? Yeah, so how, do we, how on earth do we test the relationship between these different things? So that's, that's the fun very often of supervising students. You have the pleasure of, you can sit in a room and scratch your heads together and go, okay, so how on earth are we going to test it? And you say, okay, go away, have a look how other people did it. And mostly they haven't. I mean, either, either we're a bit blind to the literature out there. We haven't been able to find much at all. There's one study in the intellectual disability field by Zambok going back about 16 years now, who in the States asked people about, they, they gave a fictional scenario, but I think did so in a very convincing way, there was going to be a local facility, a small group home for people with intellectual disabilities was going to be opening up. How did they feel about this? And people said on the whole very positive things. And they also asked them to sign a petition in support of this, this group home opening up. And lo and behold, people were a lot more positive than they were willing to sign the petition. We also looked at the mental health literature and the only fairly, what we thought were fairly good examples we could find was researchers first got people to, to complete attitude measures, and then they set up a fictional scenario with a confederate, so they said, oh, in a moment you're gonna have an opportunity to meet somebody with lived experience of um, schizophrenia. 
can you, can you just quickly set up the room? We're in a bit of a rush. And what they did, measure the distance between the chairs, how the person set it up, whether they were going to meet somebody allegedly with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, or were they going to meet somebody, a, a professional, who was going to be telling them about schizophrenia. And of course, not surprisingly, they set up the, the chairs with a different distance. But those were the only studies we were, we were able to find. So we thought, okay, how, how can we do this and at the same time get a general, get access to a much more representative general population sample rather than the usual students and so on. So we arrived with, this is, I don't know how, how this looks compared to Israel. This is also a fairly typical 1960s, 1970s, pretty unattractive comprehensive schools. In Britain, most education now is comprehensive, so you get a good spread of the whole of, the whole of society sitting in the same schools. And we're just at the moment, we're running some some pilot randomized control trials in a number of secondary schools. We're, we're only just starting. But what, what we're doing is, so we, so we thought endlessly, scratching our heads, okay, so how can we set up something that's, that's realistic? And what we came up with is to introduce catering apprentices. And in Britain, we have a lot of people who might learn catering schools as in college, sort of between the age of 19 and 21. And either what they're presented with, there's going to be a bunch of apprentices coming to work in, in the school canteen who either have an intellectual disability or they don't. So, so one group is randomly shown the picture on the left-hand side and told that the proposal is by the school governing board to bring a bunch of apprentices in to work in their cafeteria. They're all told, or the other group is randomly simply shown that there's going to be a group of apprentices who don't have an intellectual disability. They're all told that this will have an impact, very likely, on, on their lunchtime experiences. They might make a few mistakes, they might occasionally get it wrong, and they most certainly will be slower. So, so we've built in a sort of controlled, giving them space to, to be reluctant. And all the young people are then asked to completely anonymously vote to what extent they support um, that idea of having, giving the opportunity to these apprentices. Now we hope they're not all going to be terribly, terribly nice and say this is a fantastic idea, but they're going to be selfishly concerned with getting their lunch as fast as they, they can with minimum number of mistakes. And the other things we're doing, we're also giving them um, explicit measures and a paper-based IOT, because we can't, we can't get a computerized task in, in large classrooms and do all of this very fast. At the end, we, we've been absolutely delighted. We thought ethics was going to give us a very hard time that one of our researchers goes in pretending they're a school governor and ultimately lying to these young people. And the schools are perfectly happy about this. They're saying, well, you're going to debrief them 20 minutes later. What's, what's the problem, guys? So surprisingly, they've been very happy with us giving a debrief and then delivering a short education session to actually try and educate young people a bit more about what it means to, to have an intellectual disability and why we should be doing more to, to tackle stigma and discrimination. And I'm mindful of the time, so I think I'm going to stop there. But just some of the key conclusions, I think we need to pay a lot more attention to what actually things measure, I mean, for real life behavior. We've got a major, major constraint in the area of intellectual disabilities. Most people have a very poor understanding of intellectual disability, especially in Britain, we use the learn learning disabilities, and there's huge amounts of confusion, as, as Jeremy was saying earlier. So it's very difficult to ask people about behavior and attitudes without actually first giving them quite a lengthy explanation, which might be an intervention in itself. And so I think we need, to, we need a lot more development work and try and address quite a lot of the constraints. And I better finish there. Thank you. And now we'll have Dr. Shirley Warner. She's at the Paul Beyerweld School of Social Work and Social Welfare at Hebrew University. And she's going to speak about equal and uniform, its impact on attitudes of soldiers without disabilities towards soldiers with intellectual disabilities. Shirley. Is everyone so tall before me? Hey. Hi, everyone. Thanks for speaking. Uh, I'm very glad of the presentations before myself because I think they put out uh, many of the things that I'm going to be talking about and I'm going to be bringing this into research and what Katrina said so far regarding the measures is very important as background also to this research. 
Um, a bit of background on the research that I've conducted, which has been a few years now. Um, we all know the importance of inclusion, and we all know the UN CRPD, which very strongly talks about the need for inclusion for people with various disabilities, and in my specific studies, people with intellectual disabilities. And we see this inclusion very much in different fields. Various countries have different levels of inclusion, but we see inclusion in educational settings, and we see inclusion in various other settings. But one important setting in which we hardly see any inclusion, and I will give a bit of background to this because some of you who are not Israeli might think, why the hell would you want to be included here? So I will talk about that at least which is military service, the Israeli Defense Forces, which is mandatory for all people in Israel to go into the Israeli Defense Forces. And being mandatory, it sort of becomes the natural thing for everyone to do. So when everyone turns 18, supposedly they're supposed to go into the military. And you will see uh, people, especially men, but not only, in their 40s, in their 50s, in their 60s, are still talking about what they did in the military. And it's sort of one of the things that would be on your CV forever. And the military is a very, very integral for the integration of people in the Israeli society. And when people with intellectual disabilities are sent the letter saying, not here and you can't come and serve in the military, this serves as another um, source for them to have a low self-esteem, another source for the families and the parents to say, okay, here again, my uh, son, daughter is not included, and this is very unfortunate for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, so until uh, a few years back, which is 2007, people with intellectual disabilities have really been excluded from the military in general, until this wonderful program came, which is called the Equal in Uniform program. And I want to show you a short film which basically summarizes everything I need to say, but you'll stick a few minutes after the film in any case. Um, see? Okay, so I'll show you in the next one. It was my dream joining to the IDF. The IDF, Akim Israel and the Ministry of Welfare, a unique partnership enabling citizens of Israel with intellectual disabilities to serve and contribute to Israel's safety and security. I wanted to volunteer, to help, to give something to my country. To join the IDF is a privilege. It safeguards the country. I wanted to be a soldier. This unique program helps people with intellectual disabilities to feel relevant and important while providing important support services to the IDF soldiers. On that day, when we got Yaish, we made a blessing. Reut fits in here amazingly, better than any soldier that I commanded. Mentors provide support and friendship to these disabled young people, increasing their self-esteem and self-confidence. From the moment that Yaish and Reut got here, it's amazing to see how they changed us as people, how their high discipline affected our soldiers and made us better human beings. Their transportation to and from IDF bases takes place with full cooperation between the IDF, the Ministry of Welfare's Department for the Treatment of the Intellectually Disabled, and Akim Israel. Our next dream is that Yaish will stay with us as a career soldier, which will make it a huge achievement. I dream being a career soldier. On Israel's Independence Day, I got a reward as an excellent soldier. There was music and horns, and everybody clapped hands for me. I was so glad, and they wrote my story in the paper. On that day, everybody was exciting and crying. We saw Yaish and Reut, and they were so happy. They're one of us, and that makes me happy. It was touching. The IDF and military service are among the core values of Israeli society. We believe that it is important that people with intellectual disabilities should also have this experience within the limits of their abilities and special needs. I was so shy. And this gave me self-confidence. It's my dream come true. Joining the IDF is every citizen's right. Yaish and Reut are realizing theirs by serving the IDF.
that could basically summarize everything that I have to do. Um, so a bit about the program and then I'll let you know about the research that I've been conducting on the program. Uh, as I said, this is a joint program between Akim Israel, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Social Services and the IDF. In terms of the phases, I'll very briefly go through the phases of what the program does, although I will let you know that things have already changed given various things that have happened on field and ongoing as any project would. So some of the things here have actually changed in the last couple of months. But in general, the program is composed of five phases. In the beginning, uh, there is an assessment of fit of the individuals for the program. There are several criteria, age-wise criteria, adaptability, things like that, and being able to travel by themselves in uh, public tra transportations. So first, uh, there is a process to go for assessment of fit. Those individuals that seem to fit the program begin a training course, which is a six-month training course. One day a week, they come for training. They're giving knowledge about what the military is. They're giving different tools on what you should do and how you should act. How do you behave when your commander tells you you should do such and such a thing? And they're provided one day a week of this training program. The third phase is the volunteering phase in which they go for six months into one of the units as a volunteer and in a volunteer status, which means they're not yet active soldiers. But the intention is to put the individual as a volunteer in the same place that they would continue serving afterwards as an active soldier. Uh, during this time, of course, they learn their role, they learn the system, they learn to meet the commander and everything that they have to do in the army. And those that succeed and pass successfully through the volunteering phase are drafted into the military and they undergo actually a similar process that other people would undergo when they're being drafted, which means getting um, immunizations, getting a medical exam, getting their army badge, of course, and their army uniform, which are all of the things that have to do with status being equal, being part of, having the same uniform as anyone else, being able to travel in the uniform to and from the base. And then they serve in the military for a period between one and two years in very various uh, roles that are there, each according to their abilities. Yaish that you just saw, his role was actually, was not existent before. But what he does, and their, his commanders brought up a different role, which was very important, is actually take apart all um, computers. He works in a modi'in. Safe, um, I forget the word, intelligence. So anything where important information could potentially come out and other soldiers that are not with intellectual disabilities will really not have the patience to take apart the computer into the basic components of it. Yaish sits there and he can go through 20 computers a day and you will not get any data out of that computer any way you try to get the data out. Uh, after a year or two years, uh, the individuals are dismissed from the army and there is an intention to do some sort of a plan for them of how to be reintegrated into the community in terms of residence, in terms of future work and such. Uh, this is some data in terms of numbers of the program. It's data, the numbers here are not up to date for now, they're up to date uh, about February 2014, which is when I finished collecting data on this research. So there are more people since that time. But until today, about 117 people started the program. From these people, we have about 57 that are either already enlisted into the military or some of them have already been dismissed from the military and some of them are about to be recruited in the next couple of months. So this is sort of how it works in terms of numbers. The rationale for the program, uh, which I think is very, very clear, one thing is you can need to have people with intellectual disabilities taking part in all central experiences of life, and this is one central experience that other people have. And also the rationale, which this is what links into this symposium that has to do with stigma, as Pat said in, the, in his opening keynote, one of the strongest points for stigma change is contact. So this is the most perfect place for contact because everyone in Israel has to be there from the age of 18 to 21. 
So you're getting people together where they can actually meet people with intellectual disabilities. Um, I set out on a longitudinal study that had uh, different aims, and the aims of the study were, went together with the aims of the program. And I'm not going to go into the top three, which I actually already presented in different places, and if anyone is interested, I could give you the data for that. But the fourth thing that links into this symposium is what is the impact on other soldiers, soldiers without intellectual disabilities, serving side by side with Yaish and Reut and all the other people that are in the program, what happens to them? Do their attitudes change? So we set out with a questionnaire with all the limitations that Katrina has already listed before. Uh, and we had almost 240 soldiers without intellectual disabilities. Some of these soldiers, 154, with, were familiar with soldiers from the program. The rest were in nearby units and were not familiar with soldiers from the program. Um, we asked them about their subjective knowledge of intellectual disabilities, and we had them complete a few other scales. This one scale is a scale that Katrina showed you quite briefly, where there is sort of a scenario, um, an indirect scenario. We're not asking the, um, the soldier himself, but we're asking him. There is another soldier called Joseph, and he's sitting in the dining room in the military unit comes in a soldier that Joseph does not know he has an intellectual disability. They meet, they talk for a few minutes, everyone else has to leave the table, but Joseph stays there. How do you think Joseph is going to react in this situation? So we're measuring indirectly what Joseph would do in such a situation. And according to also what Katrina said, we're measuring their cognitive, their thoughts, their emotions, and their behaviors with the limitation, of course, that this is what they're reporting to us and not possibly what they're actually doing. We also ask them what their attitudes are towards inclusion. What do they think about inclusion of people, of soldiers with ID in the army? We ask them if they're familiar with soldiers with ID and some background information. Um, some of the results that we see. So the one thing that we asked them was uh, here you have a few different soldiers with different disabilities. How likely do you think the, each one of these individuals should be granted the opportunity to serve in the army? And I listed them in the order of a hierarchy of who should be granted more of a possibility to go in the army. And we see a mild physical disability, intellectual disability being um, more at the top, mental illness, which is very much along with any hierarchy that you would see in most literature, is way below. But what's a bit surprising about this is that usually one right before mental illness is intellectual disability. is usually very much below as well. But we see that here it was rated higher up in the hierarchy. Um, the other thing that you would see from this slide is the differences between those soldiers that were familiar with soldiers from the program and those that were not. And you can very clearly see that those soldiers that are familiar had a much more positive towards the inclusion of these people in the army. And um, it goes throughout. It wasn't just for the intellectual disability. We sort of get a mind change about various other disabilities as well. Um, the other thing that we wanted to see is does knowledge matter, that does familiarity ma matter? And we examine this, and this is a correlation table that shows that really the left-hand side shows the relationship between how familiar are you with the soldier with an intellectual disability. And for almost all of the measures that we had, we do see that the more you are familiar, so greater familiarity is very, very important, your attitudes improve and become better. A subjective knowledge, which also I think sort of goes along the lines of what Pat presented this morning, was a bit less strong. It wasn't so important how much knowledge I had, but the contact was a lot more important there. But the other thing that was important was the wish for knowledge. In terms of, this interests me, I want to know more about this population. This is a population that is important. And we see that that also correlates very well with attitudes towards inclusion and positive attitudes towards people with intellectual disabilities in the army. The other thing that we wanted to examine, is there a relationship between attitudes towards individuals or soldiers with intellectual disabilities and attitudes towards their inclusion? There were three measures of 
inclusion, which went into three different factors. How important is it to include people with intellectual disabilities in the army? Are people with intellectual or soldiers with intellectual disabilities similar to other individuals? Or do we need to separate soldiers with intellectual disabilities, put them in a different unit, put them farther away from soldiers without intellectual disabilities? And we see, of course, that all of the attitudes that are the left-hand column here, which are both my thoughts, my emotions, my behaviors, they're all related to your inclination to have these soldiers as part of the army. So, for example, if I go through the top one, if I have positive thoughts about soldiers, I'm in higher inclination to think that these soldiers should be integrated into the army, that they're similar to us, and that they should not be separated from us. The only one uh, component of attitude that deserves, I think, a bit of additional thought, there was a component that had to do with cognition of understanding a social situation. So there were a few items that said, um, I would not know how to approach this individual. I would not know what to say to him. And this is very important for intellectual disabilities, especially because we see that one of the barriers is not that we're all uh, bad people, and it's not that we're all trying to be mean, but many times in social interactions, we really just do not know how to reach out to this individual with an intellectual disabilities and what we are expected to do. And we see actually that this was not correlated with any of the variables that have to do with attitude towards inclusion. And I put this out because I think it deserves some additional thought of what it means or what could be done. Um, I will not go into the hierarchical regression because I have about four minutes. And I think it's important to me to get the few uh, last points in terms of discussion. Um, I do want to say that this is one of the aspects of the studies that I conducted with this uh, Equal in Uniforms project. The other aspects were interviewing the soldiers with intellectual disabilities, interviewing the parents, and interviewing the commanders. So it's important to, for me to see these findings also along lines of the bigger picture of what comes out in the bigger picture. So we do see that this contact and serving alongside with soldiers with intellectual disabilities is positive for attitude change. The more familiarity that you had with the person, the reduction of feeling of fear, the reduction of feelings of social discomfort in these meetings, and this was very important. And this is additional support for what is known from the mental illness field and from other fields that this contact is very, very important and is one of the most helpful ways for this intervention. This is especially important because our soldiers that are aged 18, 19, 20, 21 are becoming adults and these will be the ambassadors outside afterwards in the community and hopefully will carry on this experience with them elsewhere. And also because the Israeli military is considered a melting pot and you will have people from all over Israel coming, this is a big exposure to different places. I should say in one sentence that when I wanted to start this study, I contacted the military. Very, very difficult to get their permission to conduct this uh, study. They all said no, and then I got into one of the higher ranking individuals and he said to me, you know, people with intellectual disabilities are included everywhere. You have many of them working in supermarkets and you have many of them working in other places. Go study them, them. go study there. Why do you want to come to us? And I said, you know, no, you know, this is exactly the point. What's happening at a place where they would be usually very much excluded. And this is the important point and the important message that comes out that they're very, very much being an integral part of society within this IDF forces. Um, I do want to say, although I did not show you the results from the other studies that we did with the individual, with the commanders, that not everything, in Hebrew we would say pink, not everything is colored pink. And when you speak with the individuals with intellectual disabilities, many of them have, like Asian roots, very high self-esteem. They feel equal, they feel very much a part of, but then they go home alone. None of the friends or the soldiers remain friends with them after the army hours. And this is a question that keeps on ringing in my mind. 
a lot of change that has occurred with the military commanders who talk very positively, like you sign the program, this is not just for the clip, you hear this in all the interviews that I did, of how important these soldiers are to them. But I do remain with this question mark of really how far can this go and what else needs to be done to have this contact doing even more and changing the feelings of all the soldiers that are there. So, thank you. We thank you all for sticking through the session.